Good morning. I'm Tay Cantrell, CTO with Burn Global. And I'm here today to talk to you about the truly sustainable cloud. And our company has a little experience about this. You may know that Iceland, as a location, has 100% renewable power resources. So <laughs> Vern Global, as a UK-based company, is a, our objective and our development um, quota is to go out and bring 100% renewable solutions to servers that allow our customers to move resources from their current locations to a 100% renewable power grid. Before we start talking about the grid, we've got to think about how the grid is impacting our day-to-day -day lives. So the first thing we look at is, well, what kind of volume are we talking about? There's 650 million internet users have been added since 2008. That's a huge number. But from a business perspective, it's only a drop in the bucket. That's that the internet is only 32% penetration across the world. That leaves a huge business opportunity for us to go out and perform services and, and to really grow and develop over time. So how about mobile? How, is, how does mobile play into that internet? Well, currently today, thanks to Mary Meeker, uh, who gave a great presentation at All Things Digital 10, uh, she's the queen of the net, so she should know. Uh, but mobile represents 10% of all internet traffic across the line. Now that may not seem like a lot, but in 2009 it was only 1%. And mobile plays a huge factor in the next 68% of people who are going to come online. Think about a place like India. In India, 50% of the traffic that runs across the internet originates from, uh, the requests originate from mobile devices. Those are big numbers. But mobile is also not only about users and about traffic, it is about business. And business is growing. Again, uh, Mary tells us that uh, since 2008, we've seen CAGR, compound annual growth rates in revenue, in excess of 150% for global um, ad and app revenues coming across the mobile market. That's seven billion pounds GBP in 2011 alone, and it is growing, no question about it. If you think about it, uh, you can look, all you gotta look at is the number of iPhones and iPads that are coming on the marketplace. Uh, just for an example, in Q4 of 2011, Apple sold more iPhones than babies were born. So absolutely incredible numbers. Well, what this is generating, the ability to communicate mobily, to move things to and from the web whenever you want to, it's creating a huge amount of data. IBM tells us that in, in the last two years, we have generated 90% of the data that exists today. So to give specific numbers to that, that's 2.5 million terabytes of new data coming on the line every day. Now, some of you in the audience may think that that sounds like an unreason unreasonable number, maybe high, maybe low. Well, to put it in perspective, there's 500,000 new people being born every day. If we went and mapped each one of their genomes in such a way that we could do research in, in a way that we haven't even developed yet, so basically take those raw image files and make them available for future scientific research that can benefit society, that would, each one of those would be between two and 30 terabytes of data. So what that means is, if you take the low side of that estimate, that's a million terabytes every day just associated with the people that are coming into the world. Now that doesn't even count the people who are 30 years old and illegally downloading Game of Thrones, which by the way does four million uh, illegal downloads of every, every time there's an episode. So it's <laughs> mind boggling the numbers that are coming on. And if you take examples from the smart grid, I mean, these uh, new applications that are going to be coming to our houses, our home area networks, uh, to allow us to interface with our equipment in our homes, it's going to allow us to track our energy uses. It's going to allow us in real time to be able to select the energy sources which make up the power that deliver uh, the important things to us at home. Um, all of those data points are going to continue to flow into the web. These are big numbers and they are definitely growing. So. The question is, uh, and this question was extremely relevant while I was talking at the Smart Grid conference, but what is the impact to the grid? 
uh, if we look historically uh, how the grid has been handled, uh, it, it's not been the most rapidly uh, adaptable solution. It's not been the best moving engine. We, we have to tend to work with it. We, we have big steel, big iron, large cables that don't move around easily. So it's very important to think long term in advance when we talk about the grid. If we look at the data centers and their impact currently, estimates range from somewhere between 1% and 2% of the world's energy is dedicated to data centers today. Based on the data that we've just talked about, I'd say that's going to be growing. Now, historically, the data centers have been built out where the networks are best, and networks are all about people. They originate from the original phone lines, and so the exchanges have all typically been in very densely populated regions of our world. Well, that's not a good place for factories. And make no bones about it, these are information factories that are coming forward. Now, you may look at the impact that power has on global warming, things like that. 200 grams to 400 grams of carbon for every kilowatt hour that's burned on our grid. That's a big number. And you might think, well, that's not a good place. It's not a good use of our carbon resources to allow people the opportunity to uh, make snarky tweets about Ed Miliband and his 2020 vision for sustainability for the UK. But it is not our job to limit the information that is flowing across the line. That would be akin to taking fire away from the caveman because he might burn the village down. Well, you know what? He might have burned the village down, but we might burn our own village down if we don't handle these things correctly. And we cannot limit what might become. Ultimately, if you think about it, we will be pushing up daisies before the information flowing on the social network actually comes to fruition and creates the tools which will establish evolutionary change. You know, pushing up daisies is an interesting, uh, it's an interesting idea, uh, but I have, a, I have a wonderful and a beautiful image in my head now. I spent this week, as I mentioned, at a smart grid conference in Cambridge. What a great place, really energizing. I went for a run past St. Andrew's Church, and sure enough, there in the graveyard with these centuries-old graves, you see daisies planted in the middle and, and growing up year over year. It shows us that we do continue to have an impact. The things that we do today will have an impact on the future, and our social networks are part of that. We need to enable them. And if you don't believe that our social networks will have change, then you haven't been paying attention to little things like the Arab Spring. Do you think Biz Stone imagined the Arab Spring when he created Twitter? Well, in the same way, we can't imagine the impact that will happen generations to come from the way that we are interacting today. So it, it's a huge dynamic and it's all about us and our responsibility to match the grid with the cloud to make all of this work. So ultimately, what can we do to relieve the pressure? Um, it's, it's a great opportunity that we now have the ability to tie IT and innovation and the grid all together. It ultimately, the combination of the grid and the cloud is all about innovation. We need to centralize our energy resources just the way the industrial technologies of the past ages were centralized to come to the water wheels, to come to the location where energy was most attainable. We need to move our energy sources to the sources of power. Now, one of the big advantages of the mobile dynamic is that we've changed. We've changed now. We don't have a 100-watt desktop sitting at our home burning 24 hours a day. We communicate with a 5-watt iPhone, a 10-watt iPad, and these are smaller elements. They're impactful ultimately, but they're impactful because the applications that run on them are back at the data center. Those data centers now are becoming more and more of the IT infrastructure that we ultimately use. The devices with which we will interface from a true HMI, human machine interface, will become less and less of an impact. But we could have more and more of an impact on the data center side. But by centralizing, we do, to, we do two things. We allow ourselves to focus in on the areas of the best power, the green, the renewable resources, but we also allow ourselves to create new efficiencies on the grid. 
Take, for example, a place where I do a lot of business, Iceland. Uh, in Iceland, you have 650 megawatt aluminum smelters, uh, aluminum smelters, my apologies. <laughs> um, but uh, we have 650 megawatt aluminum smelters that are literally sitting right next to dams. These, these create excellent innovation in terms of efficiency. So no longer do you have to transmit long distances because it's most convenient to put a factory in a specific location. If the networks are enabled, you can put the data centers where it makes the most sense. And ultimately, it is all about the network because the huge amount of data that we're talking about, the 2.5 exabytes of data a day, it has to flow. It has to flow from the origination devices, whether they be mobile or stationary, and it has to flow into the data centers where all of this data is stored. Ultimately, that data will create an evolutionary benefit to our society, and I'm excited to be a part of it. I'm excited to bring together the grid and the cloud in a new age of sustainability. Really, it is about evolution. It's about the data centers creating <laughs> impact on us and ourselves and our everyday lives. So I'm very happy with what we've been able to do and we've been able to become an example as Vern Global. We've started to show that in, in an area such as Iceland, you really can have 100% dual source renewable power and you can have excellent connections back to Europe. Take for example this network map which shows 28 terabits of physical capacity back to Europe. That's a huge amount and it's actually growing. The innovation that's coming on the network side the next generation of ways, we're at 100 gigs now, we could be at 400 gigs in the future, perhaps a terabit beyond that. It will continue to grow. The fiber enables us. It's all about making sure that we put the networks in place to allow proper innovation at the data center level. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. It's been excellent to talk to you today.